So we used to think about development much more in terms of averages and how much stuff you've got uh, or the average flow of that stuff. Um, we're very much more aware now that it's the noise, the ups and downs, that really matters in development. When you talk to poor people, um, uh, which we don't do enough, I have to say, but when, when you do, you often find out that the thing which characterizes ill-being is that fear of what could happen tomorrow, anxiety about what happens if prices go up, what happens if someone gets injured, what happens if my daughter gets married and I have to pay some massive dowry. It's these, these sort of individual and collective shocks and volatility which really cause huge trouble. And I think that's what's led us into thinking much more about the nature of poverty, that poverty is about how, to, how people can confront those, those shocks. Um, it's about their quality of life, how they feel about their lives. It's not about $1.25 a day. It's about whether, you're, whether you feel fulfilled or scared or somewhere in between. And it's also about the people who are really stuck at the bottom. The, the number of people at any one moment who are below $1.25 a day to go back to income poverty is about 1.4 billion. In the, so that's about one in five in the world. But of those, about a billion are going up and down. They're going up in and out of poverty. And um, it's a transient process depending on the season, depending on, on luck, depending on getting a job. But there's about 400 million people who are stuck below. They're the chronic poor. They're the disabled that the previous speaker in this room was talking about, uh, the elderly, people in remote areas, uh, indigenous peoples, and they actually require different solutions, and they're going to be the people who are going to, it's going to be hardest to help and get out of poverty. And that's increasingly going to be one of the challenges we face. How do we think about complexity? This helpful PowerPoint is from the US military. It's their mapping of Afghanistan. Okay. And at first, yeah, everyone goes, ah, that's ridiculous. Yeah, how on earth, yeah, what, what use is that? If you look at it and spend like yeah, several days reading it, um, it's very interesting and very good, actually. It's quite a, yeah, it's a, it's a genuine attempt to grapple with the complexity of, of Afghanistan. But it also tells you various things about development. Because most real life systems and countries and situations look like that. And yet, the whole of development is predicated on a completely different model, which is, a, if I pull this lever, this will happen. If I do this, women will be empowered. If I do this, kids will get educated. If I do this, um, you know, uh, crops, crop productivity will improve. A kind of linear cause and effect, which are enshrined in all the tools we use, the planning, the promises we make to funders, and it's nonsense. And increasingly, we're having to think, if this is true, if this is what reality is, how do you explain what you're doing? How do you understand what you're doing, and do you do things differently? That's a bit abstract, but it's a really important point, because I think this is, this is the future, and it requires us to do things very differently to that old, kind of slightly Stalinist five-year plan model that we've, that we've been working with. The multipolar world. Okay, so in, in 2009, just after the sort of onset of the, of, the, of the financial crisis, the G8 formally said, oh, we're not up to this anymore. We're going to give it all to the G20. They're the, they're the new steering committee for the world. Um, and we had some fairly naive hopes that this could be a better process, that it would be more inclusive, that developing countries would get, you know, the ones that weren't in the G20 would get a seat at the table as well, and something would improve. Actually, what the multipolar world seems to consist of is no one really being in charge. People now talk about a G0 uh, as what's actually uh, you know, taking place in the multilateral system. We have... Paralysis on, on climate change, we have paralysis on the arms trade talks, we have paralysis on trade. Yeah, there's very little dynamism. I, you know, I, they're, they're always, it always feels much more optimistic and positive at national level when you actually go to a country and talk to people and find out what's happening than at these global meetings where everybody's kind of wringing their hands and saying, oh, it's all just so difficult and what a collective action problem X is. And, and there is a real contrast. And I think we have a massive problem in reviving the, the multilateral system for the things which can't be solved on a country-by-country -country basis, climate change and finance being two of the big ones. <coughs> Migration. So, so you know, one of the th real um, sort of high-speed changes in the world is the, um, is the amount of migration and the amount of money it's generating for poor countries. So if you look at 
If you look at this, this is the kind of flows of different kinds of capital. ODA is Overseas Development Assistance Aid. FDI is Foreign Direct Investment, Foreign Investment. Uh, and the other one's sort of hot money, private debt and portfolio. Um, they went into a big downturn, um, uh, the, the, the investment and portfolio, because of the financial crisis. Remittances barely blipped, and they're just keeping on growing. So they're now three times the volume of aid. They go to a fair amount of it goes to poor communities, creates jobs. A really important part of development is that flow of money from migrant workers back to their homes, almost entirely absent from the development agenda. So I think it won't stay absent for, for much longer. <coughs> the world went urban in 2007. Over half the world's people live in towns and cities. By 2030, half the world's poor people will be urban as well. At the moment, uh, rural, uh, poverty is still rural. But the development world doesn't see this. The development world is full of kind of images of people with hoes sort of in fields. Um, and lots of people working in development are essentially kind of a weird form of peasant romantic who lives in the city, maybe has an allotment, but definitely doesn't want to live in the countryside. And yet they, they love this rural world, which we, go, yeah, which we go to on field trips. They're called field trips. They're not called road trips. You know? um, and and uh, that's got to change. And it's got to change for various reasons. One is because there'll be no people left in the countryside at some point. Um, but also it's because if you think about where new political organizations are going to come from, new ideas, new experiments, new firms, um, they're going to be urban. You know, that's where the dynamism is. That's where the, the energy is. And we need to be understanding and helping and part of that rather than stuck in fossilizing rural world. So I think there's a, a real challenge to the, to the way we think over the next few years on that one. Waves of new technology. You know, we have coming towards us GM, GE, geoengineering, which is likely to be one of the responses to climate change. Um, we have biotech, which no one in the development community really thinks about at all, and yet has massive implications. For example, there's a carbon-based cloth, which is just like cotton, only better. So if you've been running cotton programs in West Africa for the last 20 years, you might want to think about the fact that cotton could become a redundant commodity just because of, of nanotech. You know, the, these kind of massive technological waves coming over development and over developing countries are going to have very big implications. And finally, a big rethink on the environment. Um, so this is wider than just climate change. It's, it's, it's a kind of intellectual jump from a really silly uh, assumption, which was that the world is an infinitely large system. But that was, it wasn't an explicit assumption, but it was kind of behind what we talked about. When we talked about growth or poverty reduction or you know, the size of the economy, whatever, we didn't say, and there are limits to this. Um, it was actually very politically unacceptable and still is to talk about limits to growth. But what we do understand now is that we have to think about the planet as a, a finite system and that the scale of human activity is now in influencing it in various areas. So the, the outer ring is some really interesting work by some earth scientists who came up with nine sort of geophysical systems where they think there are planetary boundaries. And if we breach those boundaries, there will be trouble. And what a colleague of mine at Oxfam, Kate Rayworth, did was say, that's great, but there are no people in that. That's just a bunch of geophysical boundaries. Let's put some people in and say, what are the, what are the minimum standards of uh, dignified human life? And we'll put that as a floor within the planetary boundaries. And somehow we've got to get to a stage where we live between the socially acceptable floor and the planetary acceptable ceiling. And it's called a donut, obviously. Um, so she's got this whole thing about donut economics, which we're now exploring as Oxfam and various other people are coming in on. How, is, this, is this just a clever way to describe what we need to think about, or is it actually a useful tool in some way? And we're sort of, the UN's got very excited about this, and there's various sort of attempts to, to, to make this a bit more of a, a tool rather than just a kind of neat idea. Okay. So I've described some of the... Um, the new realities of development and, and where we're heading and where, how we need to change the way we think. And I just wanted to end by saying the, the sort of the way we're thinking in Oxfam at the moment, which is, which is kind of captured in the title of the book. I'm not saying how do we get there is read the book. 
please don't get me wrong. Uh, but, but it's the title of the book I wanted to use, okay? Um, so we talked about poverty, but actually, I think if we're going to actually understand development, we have to shift from thinking about poverty to thinking about power. When you actually learn to see power in communities or in households or in rooms, you know, there's plenty of power in this room. I'm the guy with the microphone. I have the PowerPoint. Ha. You know, I'm in charge. I can decide who answers, asks the questions. Um, and if you ask a really good question which I can't answer, suddenly my power goes down and your power goes up. You know, it's, power is renegotiated all the time. And it's really useful. We're finding it really useful in, our, in, the, in the work we do to actually have a power analysis about the problem, how it's likely to change, and then how do we intervene to sort of shove the power, the redistribution of power in a good direction. So I think the first thing is to get away from thinking just about numbers and poverty and try to get much more rigorous about thinking about power. And then the subtitle, which is a bit small, is kind of what we, what we concluded when we looked across all our work and everything I've, I and others have read on development and there's plenty to read. Um, What's the, the pattern that emerges? And it seems to be this combination of active citizens and effective states. So active citizens for an NGO is the easy bit. It's the Arab Spring. It's people taking matters into their own hands. It's people feeling a sense of their own rights and dignity and power and doing something about it, joining churches, joining NGOs, forming peasant organizations, and shifting things. And that's you know, um, been... Uh, centuries of that have led to huge <coughs> social, political and economic change. But if, they'd have, if you have lots of protest marches and nothing happening at state level, you basically have Latin America, um, which is where my background is. And so the big thing which shook me was when I stopped working on just Latin America and discovered East Asia, where suddenly you have actually phenomenal progress in economic terms uh, and human terms in terms of education and health and so on but not through active citizens, at least initially, much more through effective states. And I think the real challenge for us in development over the next 10, 20 years is to be at the intersection between active citizens and effective states. When, are they, when do they work together? When do they clash? How do we help them work together in a productive way? How do we strengthen the social contract between citizens and states? How do we prevent aid undermining the social contract? between citizens and states. And there's that, that seems to me like the, the really interesting place to be on development for the next few years. OK, I've gone on a bit too long, but I'm going to stop there to give time for Q&As. If you don't ask questions, I'll make you do buzz groups and horrible NGO things like that. So, but I'm assuming that you're all kind of highly articulate students and you'll have questions or comments. If you want to make a comment, don't pretend it's a question. Just make a comment. OK, over to you. Oh. I'm going to write questions down so I don't forget, okay? Or do you just want to get out of here? Yep. Christoph, thank you. Yep, okay. Um, take a couple more. Uh, okay, I won't take a couple more. Okay, um, so I think you've had a lot of progress on certain aspects of... The, the, the book is called Women Hold, Hold Up Half the Sky, or that's the... the it's, a, it's a phrase from Mao, I think, uh, originally. Um, uh, and, you know... The, and I think what we've seen is some progress on gender and development. So if you look across developing countries over the last 10 years, you've had real improvements in women's representation. Um, you've, had, you've had progress at UN level where there's a UN, <coughs> UN Women has been formed, pulling together lots of bits from different UN organizations. A lot of good legislation and some progress in norms and values. At, you know, we do some really interesting stuff with the women's movement in South Asia where we started doing this thing on violence against women where we decided not to try and change the law because that's of limited use sometimes when you're talking about household activities like violence against women. So we, instead we did something like viral marketing. <coughs> we, got, uh, we produced a pack of posters which showed different forms of violence against women by uh, male partners but also by mothers-in-law 
which is a big issue in many South Asian countries. Um, and we got people to talk about that with their neighbours. And we said, OK, if you want to talk about five or to, to talk to five to ten friends or neighbours about violence against women, and then see if they all do the same. And if they do, they can write to us and we'll give them a pack. And so it's a sort of Ponzi scheme, but against violence against women. Um, and what was astonishing was how well it worked virally. I think the last count was 3.7 million people had signed up for their packs to talk to people. The, the evaluations have been pretty positive. And the biggest shock to the Indian feminists who ran this whole show was that half the people signing up were men, right? And who said, actually, our lives improved a lot as well. Wow. Um, so, so some really interesting work uh, uh, on that. Um, but I think there are limitations to how far it's got. Um, what we seem to have is a real progress on women in development. There's a big focus on, on women for development. You know, getting women to the, into the labour market, getting women into politics. Um, and sometimes it feels like you know, the ideal woman in the sort of development narrative is one who raises the family, goes out to work, comes back, makes dinner, goes out to the community meeting, organises, you know, goes and digs a few ditches, has two hours sleep and then does it all again. Right? And that's kind of liberation for women, yeah. Um, uh, and what isn't there at the moment is development for women. Yeah, it's women for development, not development for women. So there's very little work on the care economy. There's very little work on how do you actually manage that vast load of that burden on women of uh, the triple struggle, they call it in Latin America, of raising the family, going out to work, doing the community activism. Um, and so I think that the next stage has to be flipping it around a bit and thinking more about what policies would make life tolerable in that kind of situation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is a genuine question rather than comment. Uh, what is it, what is it, what's the reason that it's taken us so many decades to get from the Stalinist Libra uh, pulling approach you're talking about to one which recognizes, to my mind, the innate complexities and particularities of the human affairs? Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, third one? Great. Very good questions. Um, I don't think saying the whole world should be like Denmark um, or America or Britain is right. And uh, in that, I disagree with uh, a very big book, which is worth reading, if only to get annoyed, which is Why Nations Fail, which has just come out by Asimoglu and Robinson. I'm just reviewing it and going Arr! on Friday. Because it has this idea that, you know, the end goal of development is basically to be like America, not like America is, but like America thinks it is sometimes. It's like the American dream, yeah? And that's just so naff, because clearly there are lots of different successful ways of achieving what the state needs to achieve to enable people to lead de decent lives. And so I think, yeah, institutional pluralism uh, is, is, is definitely the thing. Why has it taken us so long? And we, we, it's not like it's, it's not past tense. We haven't got from we still have essentially a level of Stalinism in aid which would not be contemplated in any other part of government activity, I think. Um, we, you do actually, you are required to say what you plan to achieve over the next five years or next three years. We will do this. These are our assumptions. These are our activities. These are the outputs they will produce. And these will be the outcomes for poor people. This is the famous logical framework, which is the basis for a lot of fundraising. And I think... The reason why that persists is because the support for development and aid in particular, this is an aid issue, not really a development issue, the, the support for aid is so shallow. Yeah? So therefore, the people who are managing to fund aid, and the British government's doing an extraordinary job of increasing aid funding in a downturn, are very conscious that it wouldn't take much to flip that. And so they want to be able to demonstrate value for money, immediate results, in, really, in a way that is incredibly crass and they would never dream of doing in their lives as politicians. Politicians know, because they're politicians, that things are unpredictable, you have to respond to events, you can't you know, just 
run things, something through like a you know, clockwork plan for the next three years. But because of the shallowness of political support, they try and do that to aid. And I think that's a real problem. Uh, and it's one that aid's really struggling with at the moment. The role of the Western individual. Um, yeah. I think the first edition of the book was slightly a tetchy response to the exaggeration of the role of the Western individual. So in 2005, before, yeah, when you're all in primary school or something depressing, um, we, were, we had Make Poverty History, right? And this was, for me, a fundamentally silly campaign. Because it said, it didn't actually say it, but it implied, if you sort out aid, debt, and trade, all international issues, or, you know, um, you will make poverty history, which is just wrong, right? I mean, you make poverty history by having national development based on citizens and states, industrial upgrading, all sorts of fascinating and interesting things which are only slightly affected by aid, debt, and trade. So it was an incredibly northern agenda, and it bigged up far too much the role of the Western individual. However, there is no question that the role of the Western individual is massive, and I think perhaps the, the first place to think about is our footprint. You know, it's not do no harm, it's stop doing harm. So stop doing harm in climate change, stop doing harm in trade practices, biofuels, um, intellectual property rights, refuse, you know, uh, restricting migration excessively. There's all sorts of ways that I think uh, the impact of the rich countries on poor countries could be greatly improved. There's also more and better aid, or at least not much less and better aid, um, and, and sort of some of the other sort of issues. But I think there's a pri the primary thing that the Western individual has to do is to make sure that we are helping rather than hindering, and that's a, a lot about what we do rather than what they do. Any others? Yeah. yeah, yeah. In order to make this transition from poverty to power, do you think it's important to relook at the very concept of poverty and how it is dominantly understood? Because we may run the risk of falling into that trap of understanding power in a particular way to be a positive, effective citizen from that point of view and not really get into complexity. Okay. I was just wondering what you thought of the Lisa Moyer's approach that. Um, of the which? Good. Um, oops. What was the question on multilateralism? I've got it written down, but I can't remember what the question was. Um, just kind of like oh, right. Kind of Is it a problem? Um, yeah. Um, there was a depressingly good paper by a guy called William Savadoff recently who said the reason why the multilateral system worked was because the US was in charge. It had a single you know, boss who, was, who had a clear interest in a multilateral system that worked in its own interests, but also had the power to make it function. And that actually, yeah, and all the time that was the case, we were demanding you know, more um, plural, pluralism and democracy within the multilateral system, and when that happens, you get paralysis. So I think, yeah, and I th so far that's a pretty fair description of what's happened. It has to come out the other side. We have to have something akin to a global parliament which makes sensible decisions, because some of these problems really are collective action problems which can only be solved globally. So I think at some point, you know, maybe I'm hoping that this is a transition. It's, you know, that, that there has to be a transition to effective multilateral system. And more and more things are becoming, you know, the crunch issues in development are going to become those global issues. So you know, climate change, if people respond to climate change with geoengineering, with you know, schemes which charge Pull, put piles of um, steam up into the air to deflect the sun's rays or iron filings into the sea to absorb the carbon dioxide, they're not going to do it off the coast of Britain. They're going to do it off the coast of Africa because there's less political problems there. And unless you have a multilateral system that can actually give Africans a voice in that, they're just going to get screwed in a different way. Um, so I think, that, yeah, it's absolutely essential. It's not there yet, though. I mean, the, the last few years have been pretty bad, I think, in terms of direction. Um, the best 
book on poverty that I've read was written by the World Bank. Uh, they did this great project called Voices of the Poor uh, in the late 90s where they went and interviewed 64,000 poor people in 23 countries and said, what's it like? And they did it in an intelligent way. It wasn't just kind of online, you know, multiple choice thing. It was kind of focus groups and deep, sort of deep discussion. And that's what gave this amazing you know, concept of how it feels from the inside to be really, really anxious and worried you know, um, about the future, that sense of fragility in people's lives. You know, a million miles away from $1.25, although income still matters, I mean, you know, not least because it can exacerbate that vulnerability, but it's the vulnerability that is really the core. Um, now the question is, can we measure that? Can you actually measure how scared people are? Can you measure vulnerability? Um, can you measure well-being? We've just done this really interesting exercise in Scotland where we got 3,000 people to tell us what were the most important things in their lives and then sort of give them a rough weighting. And then out of that, we constructed a well-being index for Scotland and then saw how it had changed relative to incomes. And actually, from an NGO point of view, it was disastrous because it turns out that people's well-being had slightly increased over the last few years. So things were getting better, which is the worst thing for any NGO to hear. Because, you know, that's, that, well, we're out of a job, you know, terrible. But uh, very interesting because other things like sense of community, health, housing, had compensated for falling incomes. And I think, and, you know, I was at a conference in, in Delhi in October where the OECD, the Club of Rich Countries, have convened an enormous statistical exercise to measure well-being. Governments are way ahead on this. Britain's doing it but lots of developing country uh, governments are doing it as well, actually trying to get rigorous ways to measure how they feel, how their population feel. And it was best described by the South Korean delegate who said, look, we go to our people and say, we are the development superstars. You know, GDP per capita has traveled in the last 20 years. Everything's great. And yet we have the lowest birth rate and the highest suicide rate in the OECD. Clearly, there is a gap between people's experiences of their lives and what we're measuring. And it's not them that's wrong, <laughs> it's us. So therefore, unless you can get a, a, a more accurate metric for how you're doing as a government, then you're in real problems because you're living in this kind of parallel universe. So I think that's going to be really interesting, that work on how do you measure well-being. Dambi Samoyo is a Zambian economist, ex-Goldman Sachs, but I'm not going to use that against her, um, uh, who uh, wrote a book called Dead Aid. Um, and it's a, it's a great polemic. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's an atrocious book. I mean, it's really poorly researched poorly evidenced, but the most interesting thing for me is just how much resonance that book had across Africa. You know, the, an enormous number of African commentators said, finally, somebody is getting back at those awful patronizing imperialist uh, NGOs and development pe and aid people and saying, leave us alone. And so I think that, that resonance was really interesting. There are better books critiquing aid for my money than that, uh, but they're written by white men and that's a problem. Um, but her recipe was pretty daft. So her recipe was uh, wind down aid, use, uh, use the, the African government sh should raise money through bond issues. She worked for Goldman Sachs. No correlation, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and she published this book in 2008, like just as the world markets collapsed. <laughs> like, mm, bad timing. Um, so I think she's, she's really hit a nerve. And I think the nerve, yeah, and that is a, an absolutely right nerve, you know, that the people, there are some great, some great satirical journalism in Africa sort of parodying the, the, the development narrative. Has anybody seen Norway for Af Africa for Norway? Radiate. Yeah, Radiate. Radiate is it. Funded by the Norwegian government, can I just point out. Um, but that sort, of, that, that sort of thing, it's just absolutely right. And, you know, the more people say it, the better. But Dambisa doesn't have answers, actually. She's, but she has definitely found a problem. A big one, I think. Any other questions? We're going to have to wind up quite pretty soon. So, any last questions? If not, uh, one last one here. Yeah. A comment. Okay. I, I think Bhutan was the first country actually to introduce gross domestic happiness yep. as a measure, which was then taken by the Sudan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was indeed. And uh, they're celebrated, but I think it's also a bit of a liability because if you're trying to get America to do it and you say, yeah, look at Bhutan. It does, it's not a great selling point. I, I think there's some, yeah, we need to repackage um, the well-being thing away from Bhutan a bit. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Thank